Welcome to my channel, Survivor. Today, we're going to be looking at how to set up a dedicated server for Alpha 19, an experimental version specifically. There are many ways to run a multiplayer game with your friends. You could just do it straight from your game client, just open up to your friends and they can connect. But uh, doing so has some downsides. You do have the client and the server intricately connected. So if the client has any issues, you need to restart or you shut it down or it crashes, the server goes down as well. If you're playing with your friends, that's not desirable. Likewise, you have to keep the game client running the whole time, even if you want to go sleep, you want to go out and do something else. Having a dedicated server really solves that issue because it's its own program that is running and your friends can connect even if you're not connected. And the good news is that Steam makes that really easy to install and set up. A small caveat, however, some people who install a dedicated server have issues specifically with port forwarding, not being able to have players join them in the game. Often this is due to settings on the router that they have. Sometimes it's an ISP issue where they don't allow connections inbound. And if you have a lot of problems, there's always hosted solutions that you can apply. For instance, I run multiple servers on Pink Perfect and they host seven days to die, of course, as well. And while that costs maybe roughly 10 US dollars a month, that's actually not a lot considering it's a 24-7, 365 kind of solution. I have an affiliate link below to Pink Perfect, and if you sign up through me as well using my discount code, you do get a 10% discount for your monthly charges. Furthermore, it has a 48 hour trial, so you can try it out before you decide what to do. But let's assume you wanna take a stab through doing that through Steam. So I have my Steam client here as well. The first thing you wanna do is you wanna go up to games here and select tools. And I'm gonna untick games here just to make it a little bit easier. One of the ones you have here, or you can actually just search for it, will be the 7 Days and I dedicated server. Now mine says latest experimental, but I'm going to show you how to do that. You go down to properties, you go down to betas. Now if you do none opt out of all beta programs, you will get the latest stable version. Right now when I'm publishing this, it's alpha 18.4. But when alpha 19 drops on Monday, you basically select here, you go down and you choose the latest experimental unstable build. And that means it's going to install it even if it's not the stable build, but it could have some issues. That's why it's called latest experimental unstable build. This one will only show up after the Fumpimps release the Alpha 19 experimental, which should be sometime during Monday the 29th. So once you've selected this one, close it and hit install. It will allow you to decide where you should be installing it and tell you the required space, etc. But once you have that selected, you hit next, it'll download and install it for you. So while this is happening, if you enjoy all my guides, why not drop me a subscription and a like maybe, maybe comment below on uh, any questions you might have. Also make sure you enable notifications so you get notified of all my new videos. I put out a lot of 7 days to die videos, guides and tutorials normally, and hopefully you find those useful as well. After a while, Steam will tell you that it's completed the download and it says launch, but we're not going to do that just yet. You want to configure it first. What you do is you go to properties on the server. You do local files and browse local files, and that will open up the directory that is basically the full install of the server. There's a few things in there. The first one is where you would go for the log data, and we'll get to that in a little bit. Further down, you'll have the serverconfig.xml, so you want to open that up. I use Notepad++ because it's a pretty good way to edit files. The serverconfig.xml contains most of the settings that you want to configure for your server. Not all, there's a couple of additional things that you might want to do, but this is the main one. Most of them have a very good comment of what this is all about. For instance, server name, post call it whatever you want to, some of the description, URL, etc. First really important one is the server password. If you don't want to allow anyone to just connect to it, you set a password. For instance, my game servers always have a password so that I can share with my friends and the people in my community. Server login confirmation text is pretty good, allows uh, the game to pop up uh, a box, a window before people get admitted into the server and will tell them to basically continue, hit continue to enter or they can leave, which means that if they're having some time to before the connection and everything and initializes up before they connect, uh, it gives them an opportunity to, to sort of leave, get some coffee and come back and they haven't actually spawned into the game until they click continue. So this is really useful. 
Server port default, you, if you don't know what you're doing, don't change this one because it changes some of the port forwarding. Visibility, again, two is public, then anyone can see it. Normally, you want to probably change this to one so only your friends can see it, for instance. Server max player count, play around with this one. It really depends on what kind of server you have, how strong it is and how good performance it is. If you want to control the server over either the control panel or telnet, you have to enable and uh, or disable this and depending on what you choose, make sure you set a password though, change them, don't use the default ones. ESE enabled, so ESE is easy anti-cheat. Sometimes it gives you problems, so then you want to switch this to false. There's no real harm of having it enabled unless you have problems with it, so I would just leave it true. Now the big ones here, we have the gameplay, and this is how you configure the world. Now you, this is where you set where you're going to play with Naviskin, whether you're going to play with pregen, or you're going to do a random world generated. So if you're going to do Naviskin or pregen, just put that in. If you're going to generate your own world, you have to change this to RWG. So instead of Naviskin, put in RWG. The seed, that one is, uh, the game will generate a world depending on what you put there. So ASDF will look different than if I put something like this. And if I, this, I change it like this, it changes as well. Because this is just a seed that it starts to generate from. And what this means is that if I make a game seed, a RWG, with a game seed of 1, and if you do 1 exactly the same way with RWG and 1, our maps will look identical. So that's basically how it works. Size default is 1496. You can definitely pump this up. If you go too high, it can take quite a long time to generate. So uh, 1496 or double 8192 is probably reasonable for gaming groups. And of course, your game name. Change to whatever you want to have. Make sure you maintain it and don't change it later on because it actually will impact the folder structure. So set this once and then don't touch it. Game mode survival, you could do creative and stuff like that, but I'm assuming you're going to play or not, so I'm not going to change that one. Uh, difficulty, again, some of these settings are same as you're seeing in single player, and they will explain a little bit what it's all about. You might want to have an XP multiplier. You can enable or disable the creative mode. Daylight length, how the game behaves if you die or if you quit, whether you're going to drop things or not. A lot of these settings, you probably, if you don't, uh, if you haven't played around with these ones before, you might want to just leave them at default. If you are an experienced player, you could tweak them as you want to. For instance, Blood Moon Enemy Count, if you have a really good system or you don't have too many players, you could bump this one up to 12 or 16, which means that you have a lot more concurrent zombies during the Blood Moon Horde Night. Some multiplayer settings down here for party share kill range, 100 meters default, I normally put at 500. Player killing mode, uh, I normally put two kill strangers only or no killing. Kill everyone basically means to have friendly fire, which can be really deadly when you're playing with your friends. So in this case, I'm going to go back and I'm going to change this to test one, the server password, and I'm going to save it. I'm going to keep everything pretty much else what it was. I'm going to close it and there's one thing more that I want to do. I want to play around with the server admin.xmls. Unfortunately, the server admin file is not here. The way to access it, the easiest one is just go to your start menu and type in percentage app data percentage. And that will give you location of all your application data. If you know where that is, then it doesn't matter, but this is how you get it easily. Do an app data lookup, and then you go to seven days to die, and you go into saves. Now this is the server admin.xml, and you want to use that one for one very specific reason. It allows you to set the admins. Otherwise, you don't even have admin powers for yourself when you're playing the game. So all you do is, that you copy, let's say this line here, copy that one, I put it here, so that's outside of the comment one, and then you put in your Steam64 ID. You can get this one through Steam, and it's a nice thing that they added on here, you can put it in a name. This was a problem before they didn't actually have this, so when I was running my service, I put in all the Steam IDs, and I had a long list of them and then I actually don't know what the, what the numbers actually correspond to. So I have to keep an offline file and everything. So I'm really glad they added this hint and, you know, it's just helpful. But make sure you do that and change this into your own Steam ID. Don't leave the default one. If you don't do that, then you don't actually have admin powers on your own server. So you need to update this one with your Steam 64 ID. Remember, it's the Steam 64 ID, which will start with a 765 series of number. And we want to proceed to startup, so we'll back here on the Steam client and do launch. And it will be 
starting the server, saying that it's writing the log. It'll pop up a terminal window here. And let's see, start a server. It'll do some loading. It'll tell you a little bit what happens. If there's any issues, it will also throw up some errors here. So it's an easy way to see if something has really gone wrong. And the key thing to wait for here is for us to say start game done. It'll say game server is successful, etc. And that means the server is running. And while you're in the console here, you can actually type help and it'll give you a big listing of commands that you can do. And this window is good because when you want to shut down your game, you basically tap shut down. You don't just close the whole server or kill it in Windows Task Manager because that can cause some corruption. You do a shutdown. And we do that, it'll shut it down and we are done. But while the server is running, after it has started up, you can connect to it local on your LAN. And that's a good way to verify it. If you can connect local to LAN, you know the server is running fine. You can connect and you know you can play on it. Now, what happens if, well, it doesn't start up? There's some errors. Well, the console window will actually tell you a little bit about it. But you can also go to 7 days to die server data, open up, and you'll see the output logs here. And this output log will pretty much mimic what was in the console window that you, uh, that you saw just now. And in my case, obviously it says that everything was fine and that I then shut it down. But if there is an issue, it will usually tell there's an error and it will indicate a little bit of information around what happened. Normally, the only things that go wrong is that one, you already have a server that is running and using the ports that it needs to use. But more commonly is that someone, well you, probably edited the server config.xml file and messed it up. Maybe you removed something, maybe you didn't enclose something properly uh, and so on. If that really happens, go have a look at it. If you really can't figure it out, there's a way to fix it. Uh, be a little bit careful about this. Do, don't do this if, it, if it's working. But you go to properties and you do verify integrity of tool files. What will happen then is that Steam will go like, fine, I'm going to check every file to make sure it's the default file. And if it isn't, they're going to overwrite it with the correct file. Now, what also happens then, and don't do this unless you really need to, is that if you've configured everything with a server config.xml, it will overwrite it. So once you're done and everything is working, it's actually a pretty good idea to just take that file and create a copy because it means that even if you reinstall or update the server, you have this old file correctly, but in a copy that is not going to get overwritten. This can be an issue, for instance, if you are updating the server from 19 experimental to 19.0, for instance, or 19.1. If you do that, the server config will be rewritten by the default version and you will lose all the configurations you have in there. So you'll lose your game name, you'll lose your seed, etc. And if you don't have a copy of that, it's really difficult to recover. So always make sure you have a copy of this file. So are you all done? Well, not quite. Normally you're not quite done because people might not be able to connect properly into your server. There's one more thing that you need to do, at least one more thing, which is really the port forwarding. So what happens now, if you run the server and you are yourself connected, if you have a friend on Steam and they connect or join a game on you or you send an invite, Steam basically handles the connectivity so they connect through you, through your session and into the server. But if you then disconnect, if you quit and you leave the game, their connection will end up being terminated as well. And you want to resolve that by having port forwarding. That enables them to input your external IP and port and they will connect directly to your server because your router will forward this onto the game server. This can be a little bit tricky. Most people who come to my Discord and ask for help or having issues are having issue with their port forwarding. So I'm going to leave a link in the description below, which has some resources from the uh, Steam on how to do their port forwarding. In general, what this means, you have to forward TCP ports, you have to forward UDP ports, and that is done specifically based on how your router is functioned. It's all individual. Individual models, individual brands handle it slightly differently. And that's where part of the challenge is. But keep in mind these ones, normally 26900 TCP and UDP 26900 and 26902. Again, these are the default ports. If you have changed these and the server config.xml, they will be different ports. But I would definitely urge you to keep the default ports while you are setting things up just to make sure things are working. And if you really need to change it later on, at least you know you have had it in a working state once. So if you don't know how to do this, well, here's a site that is pretty good. So I'm gonna click the site this, which is the link. And this website have a, has a bunch of brands and models with instructions for that specifically. 
So I'm gonna check here of how to do for D-Link, which is a pretty common router. And I'll click on the specific model that you wanna look at. And it'll give you some of the information and it'll tell you how to log in, how to access it. But the important thing is where you end up in the end is under the advanced. And it tells you to go to port forwarding. It then tells you to verify that you have enabled. It'll tell you that you click to enable it, such as up here, you have to type in the application IP and everything, TCP ports and the UDP ports, etc. And then you click save settings. And again, make sure you don't use this Xbox uh, Xbox Live ports. You should be using the, the ports that we just shown on the Steam webpage, which are these ones. And if you get this correctly, then your friends will be able to be by accessing your external IP and the port to connect to your game server. So what if it still doesn't work? Well, that's when you have a bit of a headache, unfortunately, because now we're into troubleshooting. So the first thing you want to do, make sure that when you start up the server, that it says that it started up and that you can connect locally on your local PC. If you can, it means the server is running fine and the problem is elsewhere. Second thing to do is verify the port forwarding. Again, look at the instructions for your specific router model and make sure everything is ticked in properly. You can have your friend join through Steam invite, etc. That at least shows that they can connect, but if they can't connect through the, the IP and port that you provided, either it's the router that is not properly configured, or if you're unlucky, you might have a pass through the Windows firewall when that popped up and said, hey, do you want to accept this or not? So you might want to just temporarily disable your Windows firewall and make sure you re-enable it after you test it out. But if that doesn't work, you might also want to have a final look at whether your ISP is blocking inbound traffic. There are some ISP internet service providers which actually block inbound traffic. Once in a while, someone comes to my Discord and we try to troubleshoot it and it actually turns out their ISP is not allowing people to run a server at home. And that obviously includes game servers. So let's say you've done all this and you still can't get it to work. Well, this is where we sort of have to open up and see what else we can do. And one possibility is to go for a hosted server provider. They basically handle all the updates, everything. And all you do is you log in, you configure things and you play with your friends. It's a, you normally open 24 seven, three, six, five, which makes it a lot easier to manage if you're playing with a group of friends. The cost is normally around 10 USD per month. I have a link in the description below for my affiliate link to Pink Perfect that I've been using for many years now. There's also a 10% discount code which gives you a 10% discount monthly on your charges. You can try that out and they also have a 48 hour trial. I use them for my seven days that I server. I have a Conan Exile, so I have actually right now three Arc Survival of Vault servers as well, so I do use them extensively myself. And if you're a few friends, $10 per month is actually really reasonable. And it does solve the issue with having a lot of headaches with a dedicated server install on your PC, especially if you're having problems with your friends connecting. So it's worth a try out. And I wish you good luck with your dedicated server install and hope you enjoy Alpha 19 and I will catch you again next time. Special thanks to the great patrons supporting the channel. If you would like to join the vetted community and support these videos, do follow the Patreon link.